Hi. So in this video, we're going to talk about the role of EGFR family members in human cancers. So in many human cancers, not all, but in many of them, one of the EGFR family members is mutated. And these genes in this family member, which we covered in a previous video, right, code for receptor tyrosine kinases that play a role in signaling a cell to typically go through the cell cycle. That is their normal role. And so when they are mutated in human cancers, they are typically constantly sending that signal into the cell, and the cell thinks it needs to be going through the cell cycle all the time. So these are pro-growth genes. And typically when pro-growth genes are mutated, they are always in a constant state of activation. And so we refer to these genes as oncogenes, right? So the family members, you would talk, call them proto-oncogenes when they're not mutated. And when they are mutated, we refer to them as oncogenes. They're driving cells to go through the cell cycle, reproduce, and then grow into tumors. So the types of mutations that we're talking about, and we covered this in a previous video, uh, the different types of mutation in types of mutations in genes. Um, for these family members, it could be, uh, the mutation could be an amplification mutation. So one of these genes could be amplified. So you would have overexpressed protein, too many receptors being produced on a cell, and these receptors would um, run into each other and at a very low level, would actually phosphorylate each other in a ligand independent mechanism. So um, having too many of these growth factor receptors on a cell can trigger their accidental uh, activation and phosphorylation that would allow the cell to think it needs to be going through the cell cycle. So in some human cancers, one of these family members is amplified, leading to overexpression of the protein and cells going through the cell cycle and dividing. Uh, other mutations are point mutations. So it could be a single nucleotide mutation that changes a single amino acid that now gets the protein, the growth factor receptor, to change its conformation in an active conformation. If you remember, these receptors are regulated by ligand binding. So when ligand binds, it allows the um, receptors to dimerize, they change their conformation, and their kinase uh, domain, which is typically in a low level state, goes to a high level of activity and can transphosphorylate uh, when they form the dimer pairs. A single amino acid change can change the conformation of the whole protein, uh, specifically the kinase domain, allowing it to have high activity even though there's no ligand present. So a point mutation can activate the kinase domain of these receptors. And also a small deletion can actually uh, activate the kinase domain of the receptor, um, causing the protein to change its 3D structure. You would think a, a mutation, like a deletion, would destroy the activity of a protein. Right? If it's a kinase, you would think, oh, if, it's, if there's a part of it deleted, it must not work. That's not true. If it's part of it's deleted, it, part, it's not regulated properly. So that in that case, for EGFR family members, these small deletions lay, lead to the uh, incorrect activation of the kinase domain. So all of these mutations, when we talk about mutations in EGFR family members, these are activating mutations. They don't destroy the enzyme's activity, they activate it. In other examples, we'll see in other videos, there are mutations that destroy an enzyme's activity. Um, but these are mutations that activate the EGFR family members. So um, if that's the case, then these cells are going to get phosphorylated on their tyrosines in the cytoplasmic tail of uh, the family members, sending a signal into the cell, and the cell will go through the cell cycle. Um, so if you've heard of different types of cancer and their different um, genotypes, the mutations that are driving cancer, sometimes you'll hear of cancers that uh, refer to these EGFR family members. And the examples I'll give are HER2 positive cancers. So uh, many human breast cancers uh, have a mutation in the HER2 gene, which is also known as ERBB2, which is just one of the family members of um, the EGFR family. And so HER2 positive cancers refer to cancers where there's typically a mutation in the HER2 gene, it's typically an amplification, and this high level of HER2 is driving the cell through the cell cycle. Receptors are dimerizing, typically forming heterodimers, as we saw in the last video, 
which leads to phosphorylating of the tyrosines on the cytoplasmic tails of the EGFR family members, and the cells are going through the cell cycle. So when cancers are characterized as something positive or negative, it's referring to, is there a mutation in that gene that is driving the proliferation of those cells? So a HER2 positive cancer has a mutation in the HER2 gene, and that mutation is probably leading to amplification. Uh, the mutation is probably is an amplification of the gene, leads to overexpression of the protein, and you have uh, phosphorylation of those cytoplasmic tyrosines in the um, EGFR family member tails. A HER2 negative cancer would say that this gene is not mutated and the, this gene is not driving the proliferation of these cells. And so this would help uh, clinicians uh, to design a treatment plan for that type of cancer. If a cancer is being driven by a HER2 mutation, it's HER2 positive, then it would make sense to have a treatment, and we'll talk about treatments that target the HER2 uh, protein. Whereas if it's a HER2 negative cancer, um, then uh, it would not make sense to target or treat that cancer with a drug that goes toward HER2. Uh, same thing with EGFR. You hear about cancers that are either EGFR positive or EGFR negative. And again, that refers to is the cancer, does the cancer have a mutation in the EGFR gene and that mutation is driving the proliferation of the cells or is it not, there's no mutation in EGFR. Uh, and so that might again um, dictate what kind of treatment plan uh, clinician goes with. So uh, not all human cancers, but many human cancers have a mutation in one of these family members. Now, it's possible that there are no mutations in EGFR family members, but still the uh, these receptors are driving the cell through the cell cycle because of changes in the ligands for these receptors. So remember, EGFR family members bind EGF, epidermal growth factor, or one of their similar proteins. So there are proteins that look and act like EGF that can bind the ligand binding domain and cause thimerization and transactivation. So there's EGF, there's TGF alpha, there's a whole list of others, which we talked about in a previous video. And so some human cancers actually are driven by the overexpression of the ligands. So the cells are going through the cell cycle because there are too many of these ligands around, too many of these growth factors. So those are two common ways that the EGFR pathway is uh, activated in human cancers, either too many ligands or mutant receptors. So now let's talk about treatments that target uh, this pathway in human cancers. And there are two main categories of um, pharmaceutical compounds that would uh, treat cancers uh, that target the EGFR family members. So the first uh, are tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So we covered in a previous video that three out of the four of these EGFR family members are receptor tyrosine kinases. They have the tyrosine kinase domain. So when we talk about the tyrosine kinase domain, that binds ATP, removes the phosphate, transfers the phosphate to the dimer pair tyrosine, and that's going to signal into the cell to proliferate. So tyrosine kinase inhibitors, what they do typically is they bind that ATP binding pocket. They mimic ATP. Their structure is in such a way that it binds the ATP binding pocket and either it's a competitive or non-competitive inhibitor, but either way, uh, ATP cannot bind and therefore the kinase cannot phosphorylate its substrate, which is the tyrosines and the other um, dimer pair. And the signal will not go uh, into the cell because this tyrosine is not phosphorylated and we'll cover that in a later video. Uh, and so cells are not going through the cell cycle. Cells will arrest. So uh, there are a number of pharmaceutical compounds that are approved for treating human cancers, and they are tyrosine kinase inhibitors that specifically bind to the ATP binding pocket of some, or maybe all, EGFR family members. And so the, here are some of the names. You have the generic name on the left. You have the brand name on the right. Um, the generic names, uh, I always have, always have a difficulty pronouncing these, are Latinib, Jefitinib, Lapatinib. Uh, those are the generic names. You'll notice a pattern in all those names. They all end in T-I-N-I-B. So if you see a compound, a drug, a pharmaceutical drug that ends in T-I-N-I-B, that it describes the mechanism of action of that drug, which is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Um, 
And there are the brand names you can see there as well. So these compounds will bind to the ATP binding pocket of EGFR family members um, and inhibit their activation. And so they can be used to uh, treat human cancers. Um, there's another category of drugs uh, called monoclonal antibodies. And these are antibodies that have uh, been uh, isolated in the lab and uh, refined to be able to add, inject into humans. And these antibodies bind the uh, typically the extracellular domain, the uh, ectodomain of some or all of these EGFR family members. And so monoclonal antibodies, uh, how do they function? So they could function a number of different ways. And some antibodies function one way and some function another. Some might have overlapping function. Uh, it might not be known how they function, but it's, these are the ways that uh, it's thought that antibodies work to uh, stop the functioning of a receptor tyrosine kinases. One way these receptors could work is they can block ligand binding. So you remember, you've got growth factor that needs to bind growth factor receptor typically and causes dimerization of these receptors. So these antibodies might block the ligand binding domain or block the dimerization of these antibodies. And if you prevent ligand binding or you prevent dimerization, that could lead to preventing the kinases from activating and transphosphorylating. And so therefore no signal goes into the cell to go through uh, into the cell cycle. So antibodies could act that way. Um, they could also um, actually just act as targets for the immune system. And so we covered this in a previous video, something called antibody-dependent cell cytotoxicity. When uh, human cells are covered in antibodies, uh, that activates the immune system. Cells like natural killer cells can come over, recognize a cell covered in antibodies, and destroy that cell through something called antibody-dependent cell cytotoxicity. Um, and a final mechanism, a way that uh, antibodies can be used to treat cancers is you can attach toxins to the uh, tails of these antibodies, and those toxins actually can deliver the tox the, the, the antibodies can deliver the toxins right to these cancer cells, to these tumors, and um, kill cells in the area. So monoclonal antibodies that target EGFR family members have been used successfully to treat human cancers. Um, and there are some examples of them on this slide, um, three different monoclonal antibodies. And again, there are the uh, brand names uh, and the uh, generic names first, the brand names second. So generic names, Trastuzumab, Sertuximab, Panitumumabib. I'm, I'm not really good at pronouncing those names, sorry. Um, but you will notice that all of those generic uh, drugs names, they all end in MAB. And again, that is a giveaway for the mechanism of action of this drug. It's a monoclonal antibody. So for these monoclonal antibodies, they target EGFR family members. You might have heard of Herceptin. Um, so the, the brand name actually has her in there and sort of like receptor in there. So that actually um, gives you a little bit more information on what the drug targets. And that actually, that antibody targets HER2. It binds the HER2 protein. And so when we talk about HER2 positive cancers, for example, breast cancers that are HER2 positive, uh, that would be a good candidate for Herceptin. If a cancer is HER2 negative, then it's not overexpressing the HER2 protein and HER2 isn't really driving the cancer to uh, replicate the cancer cells to go through the cell cycle. So maybe in HER2 negative cancers, you wouldn't treat with Herceptin, but in HER2 positive cancers, you would treat with Herceptin. And so that's another reason to understand um, all the names of these proteins we covered in a previous video, that ERBB2 is just another name for HER2, and this is just one of the family members of the EGFR family of proteins. So um, hopefully this video was clear, and uh, we went into some topics that were covered in a previous video, like mutations, um, like uh, receptor tyrosine kinases, uh, and this was just talking about just the EGFR family uh, and its role in cancers.